everybody. Hello. Welcome back to Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. This is episode 60. This is a very special episode. Softwoods and you. That's right. We're talking all about softwoods. This should be interesting, considering I work mostly with hardwoods, but you know, I've dealt with a fair number of softwoods, have even sold a fair number of softwoods, so I think it'll be interesting. All of this basically comes out of a question about the differences in softwoods that uh, came to me from Mike. But first, let's dive into a little bit of industry news. Well, here's the pitch, folks. If you like the show, you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash lumber update. I love you long time if you do that. Thanks so much for supporting the show, everybody. Thanks to all my new patrons and consider becoming a patron. You could be a cool one of the cool kids. All right. So in industry news, this article uh, popped across my desk where it was a study done that coffee pulp makes trees grow faster. There were two plots of land and on one they dumped a whole bunch of coffee pulp, which again is a byproduct of making coffee. It's going to happen. If we're going to continue to have coffee, there's going to be coffee pulp. So they filled this hectare of land, I want to say like six inches deep, a whole lot of coffee pulp on top of the land. And then they had a control hectare uh, next to it. Well, over the course of two years, the growth difference was shocking. Like on the non-coffee treated section, there was just like some shrubs and some low ground cover and things like that after two years. After two years on the coffee pulp covered area, there were like two foot tall, um, I'm sorry, two meter tall trees already growing, little trees already growing. So granted, these are softwood trees. They're going to grow a little bit faster anyway, but it was, it just showed that the nutrients in that coffee pulp do a whole lot to kind of jumpstart the growing of a new stand of forest that had been previously clear cut. So obviously there's a lot more studies to be done, a lot more kind of jiggering to kind of work this into application. But silviculturally speaking, this is not a new idea. And the fact that a lot of people have been using various nutrients to jumpstart the land when they clear cut and start over. This is just particularly cool because it's using a waste product from another industry and putting it to use in a really effective way. If you can get that jumpstart going in that first two years, the growth from there could be amazing. So anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. I will post the link to it. And if anybody's interested, you can go check out the full scientific abstract on it. Now, um, unless you were hiding under a rock over the last month, you probably have seen a video sent to you entitled like ingrain gluing myths or something like that. This is a video put up by Patrick Sullivan. Everybody has talked about it. I've gotten hundreds, literally hundreds of emails saying, what are your thoughts on this? Well, there's not really a whole lot more that I can say that what hasn't already been said by Mark Spagnolo and Stumpy Nubs and every other, you know, internet pundit out there has thrown in their two cents, some literally two cents worth others. And granted, I'm biased because Mark's a friend of mine, but Mark's um, rebuttal video, not rebuttal video, um, enhancement video was fantastic. Basically, the upshot of this is Patrick Sullivan did a fantastic video with really, really strong um, scientific tested method, if you will. Um, I have no arguments whatsoever, no qualms whatsoever with Patrick's video. It was really well done. But what it told us was that the glue bond is stronger than the wood itself. This is not really new news, folks. This is something that the Egyptians knew thousands of years ago, and we continue to know that. The wood grain fails before the glue bond, and honestly... This is PVA glue, this is epoxy, this is even high glue, folks. Um, it's not really, certainly you will find some differences from one glue to another, but universally those glue bonds are stronger than the lignin that holds those wood fibers together. And that's really what Patrick's video showed us is that under certain pounds or certain pressures, the lignin is failing before the glue. And it goes to say that, hey, you know what? Those ingrain joints may not be as weak as you think it is because the wood that's stressed around the ingrain joint is the long grain wood, the strongest, most structurally sound section of the wood that's that's being stressed whereas a long grain to long grain joint has a super super strong glue bond with the weakest orientation between those long grain fibers all you're doing is relying upon the lignin holding it together and that is going to fail a lot faster there are so many other things to consider 
this, this video that Patrick did was kind of an abstract. Look at it in the terms of furniture, in the case of cabinetry and things like that. Leverage, <laughs> um, what I like to call completing the circuit, whereas you know one miter joint may be super weak, but four miter joints connected into a box are a heck of a lot stronger. These are the things that Mark goes into in his video. If you haven't seen that, I will post a link not only to Patrick's video um, that you should really check out because it gets you thinking, and I'll post a link to Mark's response because I think it kind of covers basically all the stuff that I was going, wait a minute now. But you know what? That's all I'm going to say on this because there's been enough ink spilled already. But because so many people wrote in and said, what's your take on it? My take is lignin is weaker than wood glue. <laughs> that's 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 the, the distilled response of the whole thing. Um, I did get an email from Greg who uh, says that he's been listening from the beginning and he said uh, he, he works at the University of Wisconsin, which happens to be, this is his words, which happens to be home to the U.S. Forest, Forest Products Service Lab. Um, we do more than cows, brats, and beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but he, he goes on to say, the Wood Handbook is a free downloadable resource filled with great research-based information that listeners may be interested in. He's absolutely right. In fact, I've referenced the Wood Handbook. Again, this is put out by the Forest Products Laboratory. I've referenced it a couple of times, and it's where I go to to get a lot of my technical specification numbers. It's also a great place to go to understand the actual tests. If you want to learn more about the modulus of elasticity test or the Young's modulus test or the Janka hardness. What is the actual testing methodology? What are the units being used? What are the links of the samples? All that stuff is outlined in the um, FPL Wood Handbook. A lot of really cool stuff there and uh, Greg is absolutely right. It is a free PDF that you can download. You can also get a really fancy hard copy version. I have about 10 of them in the office that have been put out over the years. I think one dates all the way back to 1950 something. And then I've got one I think as recent as like 1986 or maybe it's 96. But um, yeah, it's a very good thing to have around. Grab that, that PDF or if you can find a hard copy of it, it might be a kind of a good thing to have on your shelf. It is definitely a textbook. It's not a page turner, folks. There are no pretty pictures. <laughs> there, there's lots of data, lots of charts, but it can really give you a kind of a go-to source for technical specification data. Again, this is the U.S. Forest Products Laboratory, so it's going to be what here in the U.S. we would call domestic species. You're not going to find a lot of information on the exotics, the Australian woods and the African woods and the South American woods. Um, I I don't want to guarantee, but I'm pretty certain that the various other countries out there, I know Brazil, um, IBAMA, that's her forest ministry um, a department, IBAMA does have a handbook like this. Um, I don't know if the standardization is quite the same from one country to another, but you will find some of these things. The question is whether or not they're available online. I honestly don't know. I'm pretty sure IBAMA's version is, but like the MTE, that's the Myanmar Timber um, uh, 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 of what does the E stand for? I can't remember. <laughs> That's terrible. Whatever. They're actually being boycotted right now because they support a, a dictator government that is committing genocide. So don't go to them anyway. That's a bad idea. But other countries will have... Um, timber export. Um, EU, the EUTR, um, that's the European Union Timber Regulation Board. They probably have points, um, uh, links that point to timber handbooks as well. So, you know, it's just another option to check those things out. For me, the Wood Database is still kind of an easy, user-friendly uh, resource for a lot of that data. So, that being said, we got a lot to talk about with softwoods. So, let me start off with Mike's uh, email here. He says, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about pine and the differences between species. I live on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountains, specifically Mammoth Lakes, California, and we don't have many sources of local hardwood. There is a local guy with a sawmill who primarily saws up slabs of red and white fir, uh, Jeffrey pine, lodgepole pine, and white pine, all air dried, um, some for many years. I'm a hobbyist and I've ordered lumber from Bell Forest, but I would love to be able to buy locally. I'm also sourcing wood for a family dining table, and I'm unsure about using pine because of how soft it is. I've heard southern yellow pine gets harder as it ages. Is this the case with all pine or just southern yellow pine? Um, this uh, local gentleman has had slabs for drying for five plus years. Would they be harder than the pine you buy from the hardware stores? Sorry for the long message, but I'd love an episode that dives more into softwoods and their properties for woodworking. Great question, Mike. Um, and this has just spawned me to say, you know what? Let's look, 
Softwoods 101, softwoods and you. What can we learn about softwoods? Well, uh, first and foremost, we need to talk about the structure because it's different. It is absolutely different than hardwoods. Hardwoods, we always talk about the porosity, whether it is ring porous or diffuse porous or semi-ring porous and the size of the pores and the grouping of the pores. Are there double pores and triple pores? And you know how, how um, sparse are they? And in other words, how much lignin, how much meat is between those pores? Well, softwoods, folks, they don't have pores. No pores whatsoever. Um, what they have uh, is the closest thing to pores would be known as resin canals. And these are <sighs> conduits, I guess, for resin. It's primarily a way to help cover damage. So if you had like a slash in a tree or a wound in a tree, the resin canals form in order to flow sap to that area and harden the sap around it and kind of cover that up. Sap is like the Band-Aid. You know, it's the neosporin and the Band-Aid that goes on the cut on your finger. If you get a cut in the side of the tree, resin canals will open and the sap will flow to kind of cover up that wound to prevent spreading or further infection that will end up killing the tree. So you can look at the resin canals and that can help you identify a species. Now, some softwoods have no resin canals at all. Other softwoods have really large resin canals. Others have, you know, tiny ones that are kind of very sporadic throughout. You're also going to find that there's really no pattern to where they show up. But if you're trying to identify a species and you can see these little kind of quote unquote pores, and you're looking at a species that is specifically says there are no resin canals, then you can obviously eliminate that. But that's as close as we really get to pores. What we have, like in hardwoods, we have the cellulose and the lignin. Well, the, the long fibers that would be equivalent to that in a softwood are known as tracheids. These are long tubes that run end to end of the tree. They, they make up about 95% of the content of a softwood. Um, and that in and of itself ought to tell you something as far as the workability. Pores in hardwood are essentially dead space. They can allow for easier workability. They can lower the density if there's a lot of pores. They can also allow for easy splitting because it'll split along those little perforated lines. Well, softwoods don't have pores and 95% of the tree is essentially these trachea, these long cellulose fibers. So you're going to find that it's not going to split and cleave like you would find um, in a hardwood. It also is probably going to plane a little bit differently. It's going to chop a little bit differently. It's just going to behave differently. If you ever worked hardwood and worked softwoods, you'll agree with me, it works differently. And that's primarily because of the fact that it's comprised of these tracheids. Now you're gonna have early and late wood contrast like you do find in hardwood, but again, you're not having those pores within the early and late wood kind of defining it. This is all tracheid and it's just uh, larger tracheids and smaller tracheids. In other words, more closely packed tracheids and larger widely spaced tracheids depending on the, on the speed of growth. Early growth, the tree is growing faster. Late growth, the tree is going slower. So you're going to get varying densities. Those, the lower density early growth as compared to the higher density late growth. This can also cause some color variation where the denser sections can be darker and that's where you may get that striped look. This is very common in something like uh, Southern Yellow Pine or Douglas Fir where you've got very definite stripes, very definite uh, higher density late wood and lower density early wood. But then you may look at something like a spruce or even a northeastern white pine. Um, and there's very little color contrast between the early and the late wood. There is still early and late wood there. You will still find some variation in density, but you won't find the color contrast. So those are really things we're looking at is are the resin canals. Um, you can look at the size of those tracheids, how big are those tracheids. Um, what kind of variation do you see from early wood to late wood? And what kind of color contrast would you see in there? The important thing here, and I said this in a previous episode, is that these slow growing softwoods are going to be quite dense and they're going to be harder and stronger than a fast growing softwood. And hardwoods, if you remember, are the opposite of that. Um, those fast growing softwoods spread those pores apart a little bit more, leading more of the meat, more of the lignin in between. Well, since there are no pores in the softwood, a faster growing softwood is just going to spread out those tracheids, making them very low density. Whereas slow growing softwood means much 
closer together tracheids are higher density and a stronger tree. Example of this is um, Alaskan yellow cedar. It is a very slow growing tree. It's quite dense. Um, Southern yellow pine is another example where those early to late wood examples are dramatically different in hardness, dramatically different in density. Douglas fir likewise is the same. Huge difference between the softness of the early wood and the, the, the I should say, the hardness of the late wood because those tracheids are really tightly packed together. Now, um, Mike had a question about, you know, I've heard that southern yellow pine gets harder as it ages. The one thing you're going to find with softwoods is there's a lot more sap because there is no heartwood. Remember when we talked about hardwoods, you've got the sapwood and the nutrients flow up through the sapwood and then the waste of the tree is, is um, transported via the medullary rays to the center or the heartwood of the tree. There is the dead part of the tree. That's where the waste is. That's what causes that color change, why heartwood is a different color than sapwood. Also why heartwood is much harder than sapwood because of all that tree waste is in there. Well, since there, that's not happening in softwoods, you're not gonna have sapwood and heartwood. You're also not going to find that color change. You're gonna have uniform color throughout the tree. The entire tree is alive. There is no dead heartwood center. So because the entire tree is alive, there is sap flowing through the entire tree. That's why you seem to find so much more sap in softwoods, just because there is. Because you know we tend to work more of the heartwood of a, of a hardwood well, again, there's not going to be any sap running in that heartwood. In the softwood, the sap is running throughout the entire thing. Now, as the sap dries and it gets older and older and older, that sap will harden. It will set. It will actually um, petrify. You know, go back to Jurassic Park and the little mosquito inside the amber. That is petrified sap. As sap dries in a kiln, especially at higher temperatures, that sap will set and will harden. Southern yellow pine, since it's very, very resinous, a whole lot of sap in there, as southern yellow pine gets old, the sap will begin to set, will begin to petrify, will ossify, and it becomes quite a bit harder. So Mike, that's what's going on with southern yellow pine. That's why it gets harder as it gets older, but we're talking a long time, decades and decades and decades. I don't know that you're gonna see an appreciable difference in hardness from you know something in the big box store as to something that's been air drying for five years. In fact, the big box store is probably gonna be harder because those woods have been kiln dried. Now a properly dried softwood that's been properly kiln dried is going to set that sap. Not only to control the bugs, to heat treat the whole thing, but to also prevent further weeping. Generally, we don't find this in a lot of softwoods that are used for construction lumber because the dryness is not really an important factor. You know, the studs and the framing material is going to be sheathed by something else. It doesn't need to be super dry. It needs to be dry enough that it's not going to absolutely explode, um, but it's not dried slowly, nor is it taken to higher temperatures that will set that sap. It's usually dried very, very quickly, and it's taken to just the bottom end of the range for kiln dried. Softwoods that are dried to be sold for lumber like you would a hardwood are going to be dried slower and, and hotter in order to set the sap and also to prevent massive amounts of checking and massive amounts of warping and things like that. They're treated very differently in other words. So a well-dried softwood that has a high amount of sap content is going to end up being harder than an air dried softwood or possibly even harder than a softwood that is 10, 15, 20 years old because that sap has been set in a kiln specifically set to a much higher temperature than say you would get something like oak or, or maple because it's brought up to dry that sap and to, to really petrify it and stabilize the whole thing. Okay, sorry about the barking dog. I don't know if there's one of those things like you know, when the dog barked, maybe if you ignore him, he'll stop barking. Not my dog. He just keeps barking. And no, no UPS came to the door. No one even walked by the front of the house. He just decided to bark. I honestly think he waits till I start podcasting and goes, okay, now I'm going to get on the show. He's just a, he's a, he's a celebrity hog. That's really what it is. So anyway, where were we? We talked about the softwood structure. So as we move into looking at softwoods, what's interesting and in some ways what's easier with softwoods is there's a lot fewer of them. 
when you look at the species of hardwoods around the world, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of different species of hardwoods. When we're talking about softwoods, it's like less than 100 globally. And when you start talking about commercially available softwoods, it goes down even further than that. You could be talking 20, maybe 30 different softwoods that you really have the option. And, you know, I honestly say this is quite a bit lower because we find that the softwoods tend to be lumped together. If you've ever seen that um, hem fir or uh, spruce pine fir designation, they all get lumped together. And some of this goes back to the fact that they kind of all look the same. Because there's no heartwood, because there is that no color change, they all have that creamy color to them. And, you know, there's no sapwood heartwood distinction. Really what it comes down to is the fineness of the grain, maybe that early to late wood color contrast. For example, Douglas fir, Southern yellow pine do have that, that high amount of contrast, but Northeastern white pine, very little contrast. Alaskan yellow cedar, like no contrast. It's one uniform color. So although yellow cedar might be a bad example because at least it's yellow, at least a little bit different there. But if you look at the different types of firs or even better, the different types of spruce, they pretty much all look the same. In fact, a lot of those spruces look the same as the pines and a lot of those pines look the same as the larches. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine commercially speaking, you can get Doug fir. You can get Western red cedar. You might be able to get Atlantic white cedar. You might be able to get uh, Alaskan yellow cedar, but it's going to be rare that you're going to find a mill that's selling like lodgepole pine, sugar pine, southern yellow. Well, southern yellow pine, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is not even really uh, a, a species. It's kind of it's a, a group of species. It's going to be rare that you're going to find someone that is specifically designating or differentiating three different types of hemlocks and three different types of spruce. They're selling hem fir or spruce pine fir. Um, Northeastern white pine tends to be sold like a hardwood. It tends to be sold in, you know, four quarter, eight quarter type rough um, hardness because that's really the one that's used for a lot of furniture purposes. Um, it's not really used that much in the way of structural timber because it's not nearly as structurally strong as something like um, Southern yellow pine or Douglas fir for that matter. So we need to look at, go above the genus and look at the family. Um, there are just a couple of families to consider. Um, and I'm going to end up butchering these, but I've often been told that you can't really butcher Latin botanical names because it's not like they're based on Latin. A lot of times the taxonomic names are based on like whatever the botanist thought at the time. Um, so uh, yeah, if somebody says I'm pronouncing these wrong, I will say I'm choosing to pronounce them this way. Deal with it. So there is, let's see, look into the families here. There's the um, uh, Arrocaraceae. Um, that is exclusively found in the Southern Hemisphere. This is one that I don't have a lot of exposure with, but those of you down under, um, those of you in South America, you're going to have some familiarity with these. This is like the most ancient family. This stuff had its dominance during the Jurassic period and kind of has been on the wane since then. But like the National Tree of Chile is called the Monkey Puzzle Tree. That is in this family. Um, Piranha Pine coming up Brazil is also in this family. Um, Bunya Bunya out of Australia, it's in this family. And then Kauari out of New Zealand, that one has grown some popularity lately because it's being um, salvaged from bogs and things like that. It's actually known to be one of the largest trees in diameter. Um, and they're digging up these just massive, massive hunks of logs of Kauari. Those are all in the Aracaraceae family. Um, there is the Cupressaceae family. That's the cypresses. Um, that also includes the junipers and the redwoods, including the sequoia, which, by the way, the sequoia is not as big as the quarry. Um, fun fact. Um, typically, these this family also includes western red cedar, Thuya plicata, um, which is interesting because it's pretty much known as the cypress family. And western red cedar, uh, spoiler alert, it's not actually a cedar, folks. It's actually a cypress. There is the Taxaceae. That is the U family. Pretty much everything in there are U's. Um, uh, yeah, um, you, primarily like under the genus. So it's the Taxaceae family. The genus throughout that is Taxus, uh, T-A-X-U-S. 
the species, um, pretty much everything is taxed as something. The species is usually based on sort of regionality. You know, um, uh, English, uh, 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 English U is Texas. Oh, shoot. I don't remember. Texas English. <laughs> it's not, but it's something like that. You'll find that the regionality is added, but universally, um, all the U's are in the Texas CA family. Um, the Potocarpa CA family. This is another one of those ancient ones that goes back to the dinosaurs. This one, we don't really talk about much because really most of the species in here are small shrubs, garden shrubs and things like that. Again, found in the Southern hemisphere, a little bit in Central America, but um, yeah, not really important for lumber. So we won't really talk about this family much more, but it is a softwood family. And then finally, the heavy hitter, the celebrity family is the Pinaceae family. That is the pines. Um, the Abies genus, that's the firs. The Cedrus, which is the true cedar genus. The Larix are the larch genus. The um, uh, Pisea, uh, which is the spruce genus. The Pinus, the pines. Um, Sudasuga, which is actually Douglas fir. Uh, and then the suga, the hemlocks as well. So that's those are the heavy hitters. Most of the commercially available species, they all come out of the Pinacea family, with the exceptions of, of really, I think, cypress being secondary, you being like a very distant tertiary one. You have some very specific things. It's also got some very tight regionalities to it. So mostly when we're talking about softwoods and when it comes to woodworking and things you're going to find commercially available, we're talking about the Pinacea family, the pines. So let's try to break these down a little bit. Um, Let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at those weirdos. Um, the uh, Aro Aracaria CA for because there are listeners, quite a few listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. I don't want to forget you guys. Monkey puzzle again. That's the National Tree of Chile. Don't cut it down, folks. That is a Cites Appendix One listed species. It is absolutely illegal to trade in it. It is illegal to cut the stuff down. Bad mojo if you cut the stuff down. However. If a tree has fallen of its own accord, or if there are um, uh, where it was logged and they're found in rivers and bogs and things like that, you will run into monkey puzzle. For the most part, when you're seeing it commercially available, it's in small turning blinks and things like that. But it's a softwood. And I bring this up specifically because it has a 1,400 pounds per square inch Janko hardness. Not all softwoods are necessarily soft, folks. And this goes back to Mike's question where he said, I'm worried about using some of these pines because they may be too soft for a dining room table. Some pines may be too soft for a dining table, but not all softwoods are necessarily soft. Monkey puzzle again, 1,400 pounds per square inch. That's like white oak, folks. Um, piranha pine, growing out of Brazil. Again, it's um, this family is all Southern Hemisphere, but piranha pine has a hardness of about 810. So it's like cherry and walnut. Very hard, very dense, a lot of resin in here. In fact, um, they have something called pine nails or clavos de pinos. Um, those are the, the, the knots that grow and actually fall off the piranha pine tree and you can find them on the ground in the forest. They have a density that's like ridiculous. It's like denser than iron or something like that, which is why you could actually use them as nails. Um, those are also kind of interesting, a lot fun little, fun little side fact of piranha pine. I talked about Karari. Again, it is old folks, very old. We're going back and before the dinosaurs here. It is hard at 730 Janka hardness. So there are a lot of hardwoods that are going to be softer than this particular softwoods. Again, like monkey puzzle, it is strictly regulated. It's mostly coming from the swamps, from reclaim, from old logging, logging from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But again, it is amongst the largest trees in the world, not so much in height, but as far as girth, as far as the, the overall diameter of a trunk, it might actually be the largest tree in the world. Pretty cool stuff. I want to, I don't want to ignore them because again, you're going to run into some of these species like Bunya in Australia that you're still, still seeing that. Um, so yeah, that family small, but particularly interesting. If you ever get a chance to, you know, legally come across something like piranha pine or monkey puzzle, it's worth just adding to a collection and say, I've got a tree here that is thousands and thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of years old. When was the, the, uh, CT event, the Cretaceous event, the, the, the dinosaur killer was like 66,000 years ago, something like that. These trees were growing back then. 
that's pretty cool. And there were softwoods. So yeah, I call those the weirdos. Um, the cypresses, the Cupressaceae family. Um, the major species here, well, Sequoia, the great redwoods are cypresses. The junipers, um, the sugi or the Japanese cypress, um, that falls in there. And then the cypress, the Leland cypress, the bald cypress, they all roll up under here. Really, they tend to be about the same across the board. They're highly resinous. They are great exterior woods because of that, uh, that high amount of, of resin and sap in there. They tend to be about 400 to 500 pounds per square inch Janko hardness. Very fine grained, um, can be kind of oily because of all that resin and they're slower growing. They have no resin canals whatsoever. So here again, if you're trying to identify something, you see resin canals, it's not a cypress because across the board, cypresses do not have resin canals. Um, any of the species I listed above, including the redwoods, do not have them. Um, one interesting thing, Australian cypress, Tunisiliatus, is... Um, 1360 Janko hardness. You gotta love you gotta love the folks down under. They just don't make anything easy. All of their woods are stupid hard and interlocked and heavy full of silica. There's just no such thing as an easy to work Australian wood. Sorry, um, I love your country, folks, but man, your lumber, <laughs> it's just not fair. It's like they just played a joke and said, let's just make all this wood just evil. But yeah, it is a cypress. It's specifically growing in Australia. Um, it's in the family, but honestly, it's in a different genus, but it is known um, to be one of the hardest softwoods around. So another little fun fact there. Um, the ewes, the, the um, Taxus CA, the Taxus genus, major species are European ewe and then Pacific ewe. Um, technically, that uh, you will find some versions of Australian cypress that roll up under the U or the Taxus genus, but it's pretty rare. They're going to be unusual to run across those guys. Primarily when we're talking U's, it's European and Pacific U, and you will find that they are almost identical in their working properties here. Um, what's particularly interesting about the U is it's got this weird blend of um, hardness and elasticity. It's uh, well, actually, let me let me back up here and say um, the hardness is quite hard. Again, for a softwood, you'll find that you could be a great option if you're looking for something that's going to be specifically durable because the hardnesses are like 1,200 up to almost 1,600. Um, I keep saying pounds per square inch, foot pounds, folks, foot pounds for Janka hardness. Again, the units don't really matter in Janka. Just say 1,520, 1,620. Um, you is quite hard. And I actually have an English yew growing in my side yard and I've uh, pruned it several times and cut things down for lumber and made chisel handles out of it. This stuff is legit, folks. It is super, super hard. Again, you're not going to find um, a little bit of color contrast from early to late growth. So there is a little bit of lining in the in the grain, but it's pretty uniform um, in its in its appearance. You'll find that it tends to be a little bit more tan in color than like your spruces and pines, that white creamy color. This is going to be tan, if not even a little bit of reddish brown in it. And again, both the English and the Pacific you all, you'll find will be pretty similar in their working properties and their appearance. It just comes down to regionality. But what's particularly interesting about them, you may think, you know, well, you, that's, you know, been known to make English longbows back into the dark ages. That is because they're super hard with a very low bending strength, but an incredibly high modules of elasticity. So it doesn't take a lot of force to bend a bow made from English U, but man, that stiffness causes it to flex back straight, super, super hard, throwing the arrow forward. You, kind of like Osage Orange, is the perfect bow wood. But what's interesting about you is it's a soft wood. So you don't have to worry about the pores when it comes to splitting it or bending it. You'll find actually that the U bends more uniformly because of its very uniform structure, because of that softwood structure. It's all tracheate. So yeah, if you're really looking for make a bow, the U would be the way to go. But also, as I said, great thing for chisel handles um, because it's so hard. So yeah, U is kind of interesting. The Taxus genus, um, you'll find a bunch of different ones. Um, but here again, if you, if you go to something like the wood database, you'll find that they all pretty much work the same and look the same. You're going to find it be very difficult to tell one apart from the other. 
don't bother. If you determine it's a U, you know kind of how it's going to work. That leads us to the heavy hitter, the pines, where we really need to spend the most time here. Um, so I mentioned, or well, let's just talk. We've got um, the pines, the, the the pinus genus. There's the abies genus, that's um, fur. Um, the furs are, you know... 350, maybe 450 hardness. They're pretty soft, but they have a high stiffness to weight ratio. So you'll find that a lot of times they get used for soundboards um, uh, in, in Luthry. They also get used for two by fours and two by sixes and things like that. Very lightweight, but very structurally sound. Very, very durable. Which goes back to that SPF designation, the spruce pine fur designation that you see in a lot of two-by construction material. Fur, that's pretty much what it gets used for. Um, Douglas fur, interestingly enough, is not in the Abies genus. It's actually closer to Hemlock, um, but it's not a Suga genus. Hemlock is in the Suga genus. Um, It's actually Pseudo-Suga is the genus there because it's so close to the Hemlocks, but it's not quite. And it's got that really strong structural nature that um, fur is known for, which is why it kind of gets lumped under furs known as Douglas fur. Um, But really it's its own deal. It's much harder than, than the regular furs. Again, I said the furs were about 350 to 450. Douglas fur is 710-ish, um, and you'll find that that late wood, really, really dense stuff, can actually get up to 12 to 1400 on the Janka hardness scale. We don't really rate it that way because it's just not how Janka works, but no, when it comes to working it, you're going to have that softer, hard, softer, hard thing that can be really difficult. I know from my perspective, hand planing it can sometimes be a royal pain in the butt because you like vibrate to death going from soft to hard, soft to hard on there. But incredible stiffness, incredible beam strength, which is why you find that it's like a favorite amongst timber framers and why Douglas fir tends to be sawn in four by fours and six by sixes and 12 by 12s. It's also a very big tree, long straight sections. It's capable to get 30 foot straight sections without a problem. Again, it's why it's great for timber framing. The um, Pisea genus for the spruces they are a bit harder than the firs. You find that they're around 500 to 600 Janka hardness. Um, they do also have a very high stiffness to weight ratio like the firs, but because they're quite a bit harder, this is definitely woods that you find being used for soundboards. Sitka spruce is kind of renowned. White spruce is also renowned for making soundboards. Very stiff, but you can make it really, really lightweight. You can plane it down really, really thinly to to keep weight down for like the soundboard of a guitar, but that hardness makes it ring. You know, you tap it and you get a very clear ring back from that hardness, whereas the firs that are a little bit softer, you get a little bit more mushier return on the sound. Spruces, great soundboards. Larch, this is interesting. I'm seeing larch show up quite a bit. That's um, the Larix genus. They are quite a bit harder, 750, 850 hardness. So again, cherry and walnut are actually softer than this. Very, very high contrast here. So a lot of visible graining can be quite attractive, but smoother than that Douglas fir. There's, there isn't that dramatic um, density contrast. There's contrast in appearance from early to late growth, but you don't get that massive density. You find that the larch tends to be quite nice to plain. Um, and um, very smooth, kind of homogenous texture, fun to carve for that matter. Um, Siberian larch uh, or European larch, uh, tamarack uh, is, a, is a North American version of this. If you can get your hands on some larch, this is the dark horse of the softwood world, I think, folks. And it's becoming more and more popular. Um, a lot of the stuff coming out of Europe. Tamarack, um, not commercially available, but there's a lot well, it's, I shouldn't say it's not commercially variable. Where it grows, you will find some mills that have it. But the European or Siberian larch, when that stuff is being imported, it's a real find. Um, definitely keep an eye out for this. And if you can get your hands on it, use it. Hardness like a hardwood, smooth, even texture for carving, kind of like basswood, but not boring like basswood. It's got some cool graining. So you can get the nice straight grain look that you might think of something like heart pine or southern yellow pine. Um, yeah, 
Check out Larch if you can find it. I, I definitely call that one the dark horse. Then there's the Cedars, which is kind of ridiculous. It's very confusing. Um, the Thuya genus or the Cedrus genus. The one thing you can find with Cedars is they're all rot resistant. Um, very fine grain. They mostly have kind of a reddish brown color with the exception of obviously Alaskan yellow cedar, which is bright yellow. They are very lightweight and they're all aromatic, which means they're very, very resinous. Um, hence the rot resistance, the exterior nature of these. They are quite stable. They have a very similar uh, tangential to radial ratio, um, but they tend to be quite soft. Most of them are 400 a jank of hardness and under. You can find some outliers that get close to 500, but it is soft. But one thing that cedar is kind of used a lot for, cedar shake shingles, cedar siding, um, uniform texture, lightweight, quite stable. Um, it's perfect for something like, oh, and rot resistance, perfect for exterior siding. Um, terrible for decking because it's so soft. Um, but Great on the walls, great on the shingles, and that's usually where you see a lot of the cedar. But again, that resinous nature makes it rot resistance, as we talked about, I don't know whether it was last episode or a couple episodes before. Rot resistance means the bugs don't like it. They leave it alone. That's why we have things like cedar chests to keep the moths out. Um, that primarily is Atlantic white cedar or aromatic cedar, which interestingly enough is actually a juniper. <laughs> Uh, uh, aromatic cedar is not actually a cedar. It's a juniper, which is what makes the cedar thing really frustrating because Western red cedar is not technically a cedar. It's in the Thuya genus. Um, Cedrus is really the true cedars, but you know, <laughs> again, you're going to find that they're very similar in the hardness. As I said, they're all going to be rot resistant. So if you need an exterior grade species, look for a cedar. Just recognize it's going to be soft, but it's going to be super lightweight, but also quite strong. So there are some real benefits to using the cedars. Which brings us to the pines. <sighs> so we can really look at the pines by hardness. There are the softer pines. Um... Northeastern white pine, uh, western white pine, sugar pine. These would be the soft pines. They're going to be 300 uh, janka, 450 janka. Um, very low density, um, but nice even grain. Uh, kind of gradual early to late wood transition. A little bit of graining, quite attractive. Um, this is good furniture pine wood. Northeastern white pine, as I said, is generally grown and sawn and sold like a hardwood. That's because that's it's used very much the same way. A northeastern white pine, and we should say western pine and eastern pine, again, very, very similar. Um, eastern pine being Pinus strobus. Uh, western pine is uh, Pinus uh, monticola, I think. I could be wrong on that. But again, um, and then um, Pinus Lambertina, that's sugar pine. Um, I've actually worked with sugar pine. I find it to be finer grained than the eastern and the western pines. Uh, sugar pine used to be super, super popular, but honestly, it's been kind of overlogged. It's not endangered in the slightest. Um, and more often than not, you might find sugar pine lumped in with some of the other pines. You know, somebody doesn't know any better. Um, if you can come across somebody selling sugar pine, it's a good species to pick up. Really fine grain, nice and fun to work with. But again, pretty lightweight and pretty soft. Those are the soft pines. Um, there are some others in there. There are some other species in there. You're going to find there's a bunch of different pines. Um, kind of, again, regionally speaking, um, but you'll find that they tend to be similar to the three big ones that I just mentioned. Sugar pine, western pine, and eastern pine. Then we look at the hard pines, and this is where quote unquote southern yellow pine comes into play. And I say quote unquote because southern yellow pine is a bunch of different species. Um, shortleaf pine would probably be the most common thing that we would call southern yellow pine, but slash pine is another one that you'll find. Again, they're growing in the south, which is why they're called southern yellow pine. Longleaf pine and loblolly pine, these tend to be more widely dispersed. You'll find them in the western states. In some northern regions, um, they are the harder pines. They're going to run sometimes up to 800 janka hardness. They tend to hover around 600 to 700 janka hardness, which to me, if you've got a softwood that's as hard as cherry, I've built dining tables out of cherry with no problem whatsoever. So if you want to build a dining table out of pine and you've got southern, some of these 
uh, longleaf pines available. Um, Loblolly, longleaf, shortleaf, or slash pine. They're ones that you definitely want to look into. Again, very resinous, good exterior grade. Um, They also this is what they use for pressure treating. So the Southern yellow pines you tend to find are the pressure treated lumbers, but when they're not pressure treated, they're also quite exterior rated because of the high amount of resin. Um, the original question said, does short uh, Southern yellow pine get harder as it ages? Yes, it does because that resin hardens and it sets and becomes quite a bit harder. Um, it's going to be quite a bit heavier though than the soft pines, um, anywhere between 36 to 42 pounds. Um, um, and, um, and oh man, the softer woods are like 28, yeah, 28 pounds, something like that per, per board foot, per cubic foot, I should say. So in some instances, the harder pines, the Southern yellow pines can be almost twice as heavy. Just pick up a Southern yellow pine board and a Northeastern white pine board and you'll, you'll know it. It's pretty obvious. But there are also some other kind of minor species that roll up under the Southern yellow pines that you might run into, like in the instance we, you know, the, the original emails from someone out in California, sand pine might show up, spruce pine, uh, table mountain pine, um, out east, Virginia pine gets lumped in here quite a bit. Pitch pine is another one you'll find in the Midwest. Um, pond pine, I don't know anything about pond pine, <laughs> um, but uh it, they're all very similar. They're harder pines, heavier, higher amounts of density. They're going to have more resin. And that's kind of where that yellowish cast comes from, which calls them Southern yellow pine. Um, you will find a Caribbean pine, um, Pinus Caribbea, which grows obviously in the Caribbean. That is also a hard pine. Um, it's pretty much a plantation species. And, um, Yeah, if you happen to be in the Caribbean area or Central America, you will run into your version of Southern Yellow Pine is going to be a Caribbean pine. And then we have in the hard pine group, we also have the Western Yellow Pine. So this first bunch of species, you will find some of them in the West, but for the most part, their Southern and Eastern is their widest geographic uh, distribution. So looking at Southern Yellow Pines as like, southeastern and then another group being western yellow pines these are going to be harder but not as hard as the southern yellow pine and not quite as heavy they're closer to the softer pines as far as weight 30 35 um, per per cubic foot Um, but the hardness here is going to run 500 550 so not quite as hard as the um, southern yellow pines would be still something that's going to be comparable to a lot of the hardwoods you might run into. So specific species here are lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine. You're going to find those all across the western states and the Sierra Nevadas as well. Jeffrey pine does show up here as well. Um, Very, very closely related to ponderosa and lodgepole. In fact, you're going to have a hard time telling them apart, frankly. Um, In that western pine things, you're also going to find jack pine, um, that's going to grow a lot in Michigan. In fact, the jack pine warbler is, uh, an endangered species of bird that is only found in, uh, like the grayling area of, um, Michigan where there are jack pine forests. Kind of an interesting for the bird watchers out there. The jack pine warbler, um, is, uh, that's, that's definitely one to bag. <laughs> anyway, um, radiata pine actually runs into this Western group as well. Now radiata pine is pretty much a plantation, the exclusive species these days. Um, growing in New Zealand, but also in Chile, but it is it would roll up under those hardness of about 450 to 550. Um, similar grading that graining that you're going to find to uh, Jeffrey pine um, and uh, the Ponderosa pine and lodgeball pines as well. Finally, you have some weirder guys that are still harder, but kind of in that same softness as the Western pines, um, would, which would include Europe. Um, Scots pine and Austrian pine roll into there. They are again, 450 to 500, um, much smoother texture, similar to radiata. Um, Scots pine is particularly interesting. That's Pinus sylvestris. Um, if you can get your hands on that, if you're in Europe, you shouldn't have too much of a problem with that. Um, um, Pinus nigra is actually Austrian pine, but Scots pine and Austrian pine always get lumped together. You're going to have a hard time telling them apart. Red pine is a United States species. Pinus resinosa, um, 
going to be really difficult to find. I've never known anybody specifically sawing it. And if they are, they don't know it and they're lumping it into some of the other Western pines as well. So again, there's a lot of different pines, but they kind of all get grouped into that soft pines and harder pines. And you can get more specific in the harder pines by saying the southern yellows are the hardest, the westerns are kind of the medium ones, and then those weirder ones, the Austrian, the European pine or Scots pine, and the radiatas are kind of the softest of the hard pines. But um, the key differentiator between the southern yellow, or excuse me, between the hard pines and the soft pines is that much more present graining, in other words, much higher color contrast from early to late growth. Um, much higher density contrast as well between early and late growth. So as far as workability, you're going to run into that same issue that I was talking about with Douglas fir, where you go from soft to hard to soft to hard as you're sawing it or you're planing it. And it can sometimes be kind of ripply on the surface. It can be hard to get a smoother surface because of that dramatic density. If you really want that smooth, homogenous grain, you want to focus on the softer pines, the northeastern white pine, in other words. Or honestly, step away from the pines and look at the spruces. Look at the firs. Um, or as I said, the dark horse of all of us, try to find some larch. I love me some larch. If I can get my hands on larch, I love it. I would use it all the time. I just find it a little bit harder to get uh, my hands on more than anything else. Alaskan yellow cedar is another one that I love to work with. I love using it for drawer sides. Um, super, super easy to work because it's so homogenous and grain, but it's also got that nicely aromatic um, uh, bonus to it. So you open a drawer and you've got that lovely uh, aromatic smell coming out at you. So I probably missed some stuff here, folks. Um, I tried my best to kind of cover it all in the whirlwind tour of this thing. But uh, as I said, you're going to find more species, but what you're going to find is they end up looking and working like the ones that I've already talked about. So I wouldn't get necessarily too caught up in the exact identification of the species you're working with, but you can kind of lump it into a group very easily. And you'll probably find that your sawmill is already doing that for you. Again, hem fir, spruce pine fir, cedar. <laughs> it's just called cedar. There could be seven different species in there. You, again, seven different species of you, but it's all sold as you. Larch, pretty much a couple of species of larch, but it's all going to be sold as larch. Um, having an understanding of those differences in the pines, spe specifically uh, the Penacea family, having an understanding of there and how that difference differs with the cypresses and the weirdos, um, the the the, uh, the um, monkey puzzles and things like that, just makes you a better citizen of the world, frankly. But you're mostly going to be working with the guys in the pine family, and for that matter in the Pinus genus as well. Having some understanding of those differences, how they work and what's available. And if anybody out there has a sawmill that is specifically dedicated to softwoods, there are a lot of them out there and they are differentiating, let me know. I'd love to know what that mill is. I'd love to get them on the phone and talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty, the eccentricities of the various softwoods. And if you have that source to be able to pick and choose the different softwoods available, I think that's fantastic. Softwoods get poo-pooed a lot because everyone thinks they're super soft. They're not necessarily soft, all of them anyway, as we learned in this episode. So let me know if you have additional questions about softwoods or if I didn't touch on your favorite species of softwood. And uh, if you have uh, your own dark horse softwood species, let me know. I'd love to hear from you all. So between now and then, folks, if you've got additional questions, go to lumberupdate.com. You can submit your questions there. You can also email me directly at lumberupdate at gmail.com. Otherwise, go buy some lumber. Maybe buy some softwoods. <laughs>